we're just so happy to have them um, have Ripley with us, and it's good to see the Kings here today with their new baby. Um, we just had a rose for her a couple weeks ago, so I'm so glad y'all are here. The choir's going to start us off this morning, and then um, I'll ask you guys to join us.
welcome to those of you who are here in person with us, those of you joining us online, we're glad that you are worshiping with us here at Mill Creek this morning. Um, if you did not already know, I'm going to put a plug in real quick, and then we're going to pray for our dessert auction. We have a dessert auction following this worship hour down in our fellowship hall. It is a crazy fun time. And uh, lunch is available. You come down and uh, bid on some amazing dessert quilts and other things that are down there. All of the proceeds from today go to help uh, us support a preschool in the Dominican Republic. This is the 13th dessert auction. And uh, Debbie and I were talking, what do we decide? It's our fourth? Yeah. Our fourth. And so uh, we're excited to be there and to, to just see what God does there with the dessert auction. Thanks to all of you who have participated by supplying things to be auctioned off. And now uh, thanks to you all for coming and just opening up your wallets later on. <laughs> Some wonderful message. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, welcome back to the sanctuary. What do you think? The first hour, they were just like, and I said, well, we'll be back in the fellowship hall next week because we put wallpaper back up, I guess. <laughs> Y'all have redeemed the first hour. So, yeah, it is such a, so beautiful in this place. And I have enjoyed walking in daily and watching the transformation of this setting. But I'm just so grateful to be back in here. There is something sweet and special about this room. And um, so I'm, I'm excited we're back in it. We're going to enter into a time of prayer right now. I want to share a few uh, prayer requests along with the many that are on our prayer list. First of all, Jay Gilliland is our person of prayer for this week. Jay and his wife Heather and their kids typically attend the first hour of worship, sit right back here. And uh, uh, Cindy and I, we have, we have code in the office. We'll say something like, piano side, three rows from the back, outside eye. <laughs> That's how we identify you guys. And then when y'all switch sides, <laughs> as I'm looking around this morning, it like really throws us for a loop. That's okay. I'm glad you do. Keep us on our toes. But Jake, y'all are laying those our first prayer for this week. We are grateful, Cindy. You, you are missed when you're not here. So we are glad that you are healthy enough to be back today. But continue to pray for Cindy. Um, I haven't asked her, but I feel like she might have her church face on this morning because she's still recovering, and we want her to get better all the way. And so continue to lift Cindy up. Um, Josephine Powell returned to the doctor this week, and um, things are looking good with her recent foot surgery. She still experiences a good bit of pain from that. And so uh, pray for Josephine and pain relief um, following the surgery. We've got a lot of folks on our prayer list who just deal with chronic back pain issues. We want to remember to pray for those as well as uh, Luann Millsaps. Luann was here last Sunday and I'm trying to remember. I think she said she had one more chemo treatment and then she has surgery coming up. I want to remember Luann and Millsaps and others who are dealing with cancer as well. And then folks, we just need to be in prayer for Turkey and Syria right now. And the aftermath of these earthquakes, last number I heard was over 28,000 uh, people that have been killed as a result. Last night when I was watching the news, one of the reports is, as rescuers were trying to pull people out, the building collapsed on rescuers. And so um, folks from the U.S. are there helping to uh, provide assistance and rescue efforts. They pulled some people, been, been trapped for five days, and they pulled them out alive. And so there's a lot of hope still there, but a lot of loss as well. And we want to remember that. Um, I will bring you updates as soon as I hear any response that the Baptist General Association of Virginia, who we uh, partner with, um, sends out something and as to what they are doing. We will make you aware of that so that you can give uh, through that um, venue if you want to do that. Uh, again, a lot of folks that are on our list, so I would encourage you as I lead us in prayer, you can either affirm what I'm praying or um, just pray whatever the Spirit lays on your heart to pray about this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we do come before you on this Lord's Day, thanking you for the opportunity we have to gather in the beauty of this sanctuary, Father, and we know Scripture promises where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in their midst. And Father, there's just always been something sweet and special about your spirit in this room. 
And so we are glad, delighted to be back in it. As the psalmist said, I was glad when they said, come, let's go to the house of the Lord. And I was so excited this morning to return to this room for worship. Father, thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for loving us so much and caring for us, Lord, that you call us to bring our requests to you. Father, we thank you for Jay Gilliland. We thank you for his family, for what they mean to our church family. We pray your blessings on Jay this week and um, his work, as well as a husband and a father, that you would just guide and direct him in all areas of his life. Father, that you would be evident, seen through various aspects of his life. Continue to watch over him and his family. Lord, we come before you thanking you for Cindy, thanking you for help, and pray that her help continues to restore, be restored, and Lord, that um, she'll get over this bronchitis and everything that she's had and go completely into her body this time. Lord, we pray for those like Josephine who have recently gone through procedures and are still recovering. Father, we pray for pain management, and Lord, that uh, thank you for medicines that can help us when our bodies are in need, so we just continue to pray for those. For Luann Vilsaps, others, Sue Sweet, and folks on our prayer list who are going through the process of cancer, Lord, we pray that the medications they're on would help restore health and healing to their bodies, and Lord, that you would just watch over them through the process. Father, for those in Turkey and Syria whose lives were completely changed this past week as a result of earthquakes and tremors and aftershocks. And Father, for those who have gone to those countries to help with rescue and recovery efforts, Lord, we lift them up and we pray for safety. We pray that they're able to find those who are still alive but stuck in rubble and in pockets of buildings. And Lord, that you would just watch over them. Father, I'm reminded even as I think of those areas of the war in Ukraine and Father, pray that peace will come to that area quickly. Lord, for our church family, there are so many who are struggling with chronic issues. Lord, you know who they are. And so, Father, we lift them up to you and pray, Lord, that they would see you in the midst of the difficult times that they find themselves in. Father, for the preschool in the Dominican, for the opportunity we have to support the preschool through a dessert auction and lunch after worship, Lord. We pray your blessings on it. Lord, multiply the gifts that we give, Father, so that your word can continue to be shared and spread in that place. And Father, as we give our gifts now through the collection of our tithes and offerings, Lord, you, you know the heart, you know the attitude in which we give. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless the gift and the giver. Lord, that you would multiply it, that as we send it out from Mill Creek to other countries to help in ways of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray that you would just multiply beyond anything that we can ask or imagine. Lord, for this rose that represents Ripley's life, Lord, we give you thanks for new life. And continue to pray for her and her parents, Lord, as she continues to mature and to grow. Father, we pray that that would be in Christ's likeness, that one day your spirit would speak to her heart and would draw her into a personal relationship with you. Father, for us, as we give, as we worship through giving, as we worship through singing, as we worship through looking at your word, Father, speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
the Lexus chocolate, in case you don't know, but I think most everybody knows uh, by now this is Lexus. Do I have that one? Okay, is that good? Uh, uh, Thank you for that beautiful reminder of our life. And no matter where we find ourselves or how we see ourselves, Jesus sees us through a different lens. We're kind of talking about that um, in our sermon series. Let me encourage you to take your Bibles this morning and to open them up to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And as you're making your way there, you're going to find Isaiah kind of midpoint in your Bible, if you would, a little way maybe a little further to the right than the left, but um, Isaiah is right there toward the middle. Have you ever been watching a movie? You're focused on the movie, and all of a sudden, something happens, and you just kind of get wide-eyed, and you sit there staring and going, man, I didn't see that coming. It happens a lot on America's Got Talent, 
all of a sudden, you know, they're interviewing this shy, quiet, reserved little soul. And you're sitting there thinking, who suggested to this person to subject themselves to this? And then all of a sudden they start singing and you go, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming is something I've been thinking about this week as I've been preparing for this. I didn't see that coming can be taken in a positive way as well as in a negative way. Wow, man, I didn't see that coming. Woohoo! Or it could be one of those things where you go, man, I, I didn't see that coming. I studied hard for that test. I thought I had it all together and I, I, I just didn't see that coming. You find yourself involved in an accident and oftentimes, one of the people will say, I didn't see them coming. I didn't see that coming. You have no idea that you're as sick as you are until you go to the doctor. They run tests, and the doctor calls you back and says, I need you to come to my office. And all of a sudden, you're going, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming catches us by surprise, so much so that last night at 930, I'm a grazer. That's why I look like a cow. <laughs> I like to snack. And my wife tries to help me by keeping healthy snacks on hand. And so on our kitchen counter is a big tub of mixed nuts. And whenever I get a hankering, I'll just go spin the top off, grab a handful, put the top back on, and go about my business. Well, last night, by 9.30, I was feeling a hankering. So I went to the sink and I washed my hands. I'm telling you all this because there's, there's a reason. I washed my hands really good. I had on a long sleeve, kind of loose fitting long sleeve, just a t-shirt and washing my hands and I turn and I go over to the stove and a towel is hanging there. So I dry my hands real good. I go over and I spin the top off and I don't know what I was doing, but I wasn't paying attention. So I spun the top off, reached my hand down in like I normally do, pulled it out, put the top back on and threw some nuts back in my mouth. And at that very moment that I crunched a nut, I went, no! <laughs> Somehow a stink bug. <laughs> it was the nut that I crunched. The stink bug was on its back going... along with nut debris. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> the beauty of a mustache, I can kind of still smell it. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Typically catches us by surprise. We're in this sermon series, Did You See That? We're discovering what the prophet Isaiah saw when he went to church on just a regular occasion. And what we can learn from his experience and the things that he saw, well, at church that day. We typically see whatever it is we come to church looking for. And on this occasion, when Isaiah came to church, he saw God, and he didn't just see God, he saw God high and lifted up, according to the passage we're going to be reading. And so whatever else Isaiah saw at church that day, I can guarantee God was in the middle of it. God was in the mix that day. We know that there are several ways in which we see things. We talked about this last week. We see things through our physical sight. We can look around and see one another right now. If I had been paying attention, I may have seen the stink bug. We can see things through our mental image. I just told a story that made all of you go, Ew! You didn't see it, but you could see it in your mental image, your mental vision. We also have spiritual vision that we look through. And we saw last week where... Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We can see things through our spiritual lens. And if you want to see God when you come to church, which 
call me crazy. I think that ought to be the motive for each one of us. If you want to see God when you come to church, you can. It simply begins by looking for Him as you enter into this time of worship. Because you typically see what you come looking for. Isaiah went to church and he saw God. Let's see what else he saw. Follow along with me beginning in verse 1 of chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So not only did Isaiah see God, what we discovered last week when he went to church, but Isaiah also saw himself that day. When we come to church, we see God, and what we see in God ought to point us to ourselves. When Isaiah saw and heard the angel saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is filled with His glory. When Isaiah saw and experienced the angels saying that. When Isaiah experienced the temples of, or, or the temple tremble, and he recognized that he was in the presence of Yahweh, the holy God, King of Israel. When he noticed at that moment whose presence he was in. Isaiah didn't just see God, he saw himself. And when he saw himself compared to God's glory, compared to God's holiness, compared to everything that he experienced in God, at that moment when he saw himself, he cried, Woe is me, for I am un." done. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. At that moment when Isaiah saw God and he saw himself, he didn't see the priest there in the temple. He didn't see the temple musicians or the temple singers at that moment. Nothing else was in that place except for Isaiah and for God. He didn't notice, he didn't have a clue who was sitting next to him or near him or around him. It was just him and God. Because when you're in the presence of God, nothing else truly matters. When Isaiah saw himself, he didn't like what he saw. When Isaiah saw himself, he saw himself as unworthy. He saw himself as unclean. And he saw himself as undone. Isaiah didn't like what he saw, but he had to come to terms with it. He was able to see himself through God's eyes. Last week, I want to, I want to come back around to one of the statements I made last week because it applies to this week as well. I said we see what we are looking for when we come to church. So often we don't come to church looking to see God or ourselves because although we have physical vision... Although we have mental vision, and hopefully we have spiritual vision, if you've entered into a relationship with him, he's given you that. Even though we can see physically, we can see in our mind's eye, and we can see through our heart, we can still be as blind as a bat. You're looking at me right now. I'm looking at you. We can still be as blind as bats. Jesus prayed about our blindness when he was hanging on the cross. Luke recorded it in Luke 23, 34. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They're blind. They're blindness. They can't see what they're doing at this moment. They can't see how they're living. They can't see. Father, forgive them. You know, I think about that. And I look in the Gospels at the various times where Jesus physically healed somebody's blindness. And it wasn't just to give them their sight. 
It was to help them see a deeper spiritual meaning. What Jesus was doing at that moment was not just helping them to see physically. He was helping to open up the spiritual vision of their heart as well. Jesus knew that one of our greatest problems is that we don't see ourselves. The Bible gives us some examples of people who couldn't see themselves. We talked about King David last week. David was remorseful for his sin that he committed with Bathsheba. But you know, one thing we never see from David, we never see David go back and say, what got me to there? I always say, how we get to some place matters. Where we go from there is what really matters. And so King David, I think, my guess is this, he probably experienced moments of spiritual dryness in his life. Moments of spiritual wilderness. Moments where David probably looked around and thought, God, where are you? I'm not really experiencing you in my life right now. God, where have you gone to? What has happened? I've had those moments in my life. I've had those dry moments in my life where I've just felt like so disconnected from God. And I have to believe that that's probably where David was and what made, it, made him vulnerable to the point where he ended up committing adultery. He didn't just decide to do that. It was a matter of blindness in his life. He hadn't seen how disconnected from God, as my guess, that he had become. David, a man after God's own heart, had difficulty seeing himself. Isaiah saw himself when he saw God. Job did the same thing. Job saw God and repented in Job 42, 5 through 6. Job said, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. My eyes have seen you. I see myself. I despise myself, Job said, and I repent in dust and ashes. Luke in Luke 18 tells us a story about a rich ruler who was blind and couldn't see himself. He came to Jesus asking, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What did Jesus tell him? Go and sell your possessions and come follow me. The rich ruler went away sad. Why? Because he couldn't see that his material possessions had caused his blindness in his life. He was searching for eternal life, but he experienced blindness as a result of his possessions. Jesus knew that, so Jesus was trying to help him out. Peter was blind to himself. Jesus tried to let Peter know, Peter, this is what's going to happen. Peter said, no, 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 not me, not me. Peter was so strong, he couldn't admit that he had a cowardly bone in his body. But the third time that rooster crowed, he recognized his blindness. It caused him to not be able to see what Jesus was trying to share with him. The great apostle Paul, man, this guy's credited with writing the majority of our New Testament. He had to physically be made blind in order to see Jesus. And then when he was, Scripture says, scales began to fall from his eyes. And Paul became this great preacher, this great evangelist who drew people, continues to draw people to Christ through his writings. But even as Paul grew in his relationship with Jesus, Paul struggled with spiritual blindness. Just look at Romans chapter 7. He writes about not being able to see himself when in frustration he admitted to not understanding his own actions. I don't understand why I do the things I do. He was experiencing spiritual blindness. Why? Because we typically see what we're looking for. We can be quick to point out the blindness in someone else's life. We can be quick to recognize their faults and their shortcomings. You know, Jesus addressed spiritual blindness in Matthew chapter 7, in verses 1 through 5. He began to say, you know what? Don't judge or be judged with the same measure that you judge others. And before you try to remove that speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, you might want to consider the planks coming out of your own eyes. I can't see you. I have planks in my eyes. But by golly, I sure can see the stardust in yours. Or so I think. Spiritual blindness. It can keep us from seeing 
God, it can keep us from seeing ourselves. I told you all last Sunday, whenever I go to church, wherever I go to church, I like to sit up front for a variety of reasons, and it's been that way. I mean, it's just been that way for a long time. But because I sit up front, I can't see who's behind me. And this week I had some repenting to do. Because I remember times where I sat in church and I sat up front and the pastor was preaching and I was sitting there thinking, go on with yourself now. So-and-so needs to hear this one. I hope they're here today. Wish I hadn't sat up front so I could see if they're here today. And it was typically in those same sermons where all of a sudden the Holy Spirit took the plank from my eye, used it behind the back of my head, and I went, didn't see that one coming. This sermon was meant for me, not for them. I've heard some of you say, I've said, there have been moments where I've been sitting in church, it didn't matter who all was around me, at that moment I thought it was me and God and the preacher was speaking God's word straight to me. I left there saying, man, that one hit me square between the eyes. That one was for me. Why? Because I have a hard time seeing and recognizing my own blindness. But you know, when we truly see God, when we truly experience His holiness, we will always realize our personal sinfulness and shortcomings. Notice that when Isaiah saw God, he saw himself and he saw his personal sin. Did you, did you notice what body part Isaiah called out for his personal sin at that very moment? Look at it again in verse 5. Isaiah mentions it as he confesses. He talks about his unclean lips. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah recognized his unclean lips. Jesus talked about in Luke 6, 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Last week we saw our ability to see God depends on the condition of our heart. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Isaiah recognized that the impurity of his heart was causing impurity of his lips. Because unclean lips are the product of an unclean heart. Jesus said the condition of our heart was key to seeing and experiencing God. And when Jesus, remember, when Jesus talked about our heart, he was talking about the master control center of our life, the motherboard of a computer, if you would. It's where our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, all of those things come out of our heart. And so Jesus was saying, those who are pure in heart will see God. Another Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah, if you just flip a few more books to the right, you'll find Jeremiah. Go ahead and and turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 13. We're going to look at a couple of passages there. But Jeremiah had a lot to say about the wickedness of the human heart and how our hearts can keep us from seeing and experiencing God as well as seeing and experiencing ourselves. We looked at Jeremiah 17, 9 last week where Jeremiah said to guard your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Beyond cure, Jeremiah said, who can understand it? And then in Jeremiah 17, 10, God speaking to Jeremiah said, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Jeremiah was all about the heart issue of humanity. All through this book, you see him coming back and forth to the heart of the person. When we see God, God helps us to see our heart and what's really inside of our hearts. And Jeremiah gives some consequences of an impure heart. First, he says that an impure heart is a silent killer. 
You know how high blood pressure can be a silent killer today? Heart disease is a silent killer. Oftentimes people have a heart attack and go, I didn't see that coming. Because it's a silent thing. Undetected sin in our heart can silently kill us spiritually. And one of the things that I think was so frustrating to Jeremiah was the people whom he loved, the people who he had been called to serve and to preach to, refused to believe the things that he was telling them. He continually told them that bad things were coming their way and that although they couldn't see it at the moment, it was coming and they needed to be ready, they needed to be prepared, but they couldn't see themselves, so they couldn't see what Jeremiah was saying. Their blindness was silently killing them without them even knowing it. And in Jeremiah 13, 22, look at that verse. Jeremiah is responding to the people. I can, I can just picture him shaking his head at this moment like, I keep telling you, you're not listening. I keep telling you, you're not listening. And so he finally says, and if you ask yourself, why has this happened to me? It's because of your many sins. When you get to that point where in frustration you go, didn't see that coming. Why is this happening to me? It's be, Jeremiah says, because of your sins. Why? He goes on to say, because sin is enslaving. A lot of people over the course of my life, not just ministry, but when I've tried to share Jesus Christ with people, there's been a number of people who have said, yeah, you know, I, I, I know that I need to invite Jesus into my heart. I know that I need to do that, but I, I've got some things I need to work on first. What they're saying is, I've got some sin that I need to take care of before I invite Jesus to come in and take care of my sin. And there, you, you may have some sin in your life that you can control. You may have some things that you go, you know what, I've got a pretty good grip on this. I got this taken care of. But Jeremiah, in verse 23 of chapter 13, says, you may be able to control some things, but you, have, you are powerless to control everything. Jeremiah 13, 23, can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Jeremiah is saying, you may be, you, you may be capable of changing one or two things, but you are completely incapable of becoming sinless. You can't change your sin nature any more than you can change your skin color, he says. It's who you are by nature. It's who I am by nature. It's like what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 7, 14 to 25. There's an enslavement that results in the sin in our heart. And we are helpless to fix it on our own. Well, like I said last week, we, it, it doesn't end there. There is a cure. Jeremiah said sin is fatal. As he looked around, he saw the disease of sin that was infecting his people. That's why he wrote Jeremiah 17, 9. That's why he said, man, all I see is sin, sin, sin. I keep trying to help these people see it for themselves, and they can't. The heart is deceitful. Above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? Paul told the church at Rome, the wages of sin is death. Not because of some random act of God. Oh, well, I guess you all going to die now. No, it's because by nature, that's who we are. It's part of the disease. But the disease can be cured if we will just take the time to see the great physician. That's what Jeremiah reminds the people of. It's bad enough to be sick and not know it. It's even worse to be sick and say, I ain't going to the doctor. I know I'm dying. I ain't going to the doctor. We all die at some point, right? So, hey, this may, it must be my time. What if the doctor can help? People don't want to go see the doctor because then they know they'll have to confront whatever it is going on in their lives. The disease can be cured just simply by going to see the great physician we can't heal ourselves. We can't change our nature. But there is hope for our heart. The problem was the same in Jeremiah's day as today. People just weren't going to the doctor. Jeremiah wasn't preaching to put people down. He wasn't preaching to make them feel bad. He was preaching trying to help them up. He was preaching trying to help them see the issues. He wanted them to get saved. He didn't want to condemn them. 
Jeremiah talked about, if you went to Jeremiah 8.18 to 9.1, write that down for later on, Jeremiah 8.18 to 9.1. Jeremiah's talking about the sin problem. He's talking about it's, it's curable, and he references this balm in Gilead. And he talks about people not going to the doctor. This balm in Gilead. Gilead was an area just east of the Jordan. And Gilead was known for its healing ointment that was made from some of the resin of the trees or bushes. We don't know what trees or bushes. We just know that it, it was a popular balm. You can go all the way back to Genesis and see the balm of Gilead referenced in the Joseph story. When the the Ishmaelite travelers come along, Genesis references the balm that they have that is precious. But Jeremiah talks about the balm in Gilead, healing ointment. There's balm, there's plenty of balm in Gilead, Jeremiah is telling the people. So what does that have to do with us? Well, from Jeremiah, we discover that the balm of Gilead really is more than a balm. Jeremiah is talking about the significance of spiritual health that the balm provides. Spiritual health. When we have a heart disease, when our heart is impure, when like Isaiah, we look around and go, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. All this stuff. Jeremiah is saying there is hope for the Christian enslaved by sin. God is eager to provide healing. We only need to turn from our sin, repent as Job did, and seek Him with our hearts and with our lives. So as long as the Word of God is being proclaimed, it's never too late to ask God for healing It's never too late to ask God for saving. Sure, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. When the balm of Christ's blood is applied, the healing begins to restore our impure hearts. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. What Christ accomplished on the cross, His blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, when we applied that balm to our hearts, healing begins to restore our hearts. Just as seeing God has a lot to do with the condition of our hearts, the same is true for seeing ourselves as God sees us. That's part of the problem. I think we, we, don't, we, we see ourselves and we're like, I don't want to have to deal with that. I don't want to have to recognize that. I don't want to have to claim that. But Jeremiah reminds us we all have heart issues that causes blindness to who we really are and what we're really like. It's a disease that causes enslavement, he said, to the point in which we don't have the power to change ourselves. It it can be fatal if left untreated, if left alone. It'll spiritually kill us. But because of God's love for us, as Alexis sang, Jesus loves me, this I know. Because of God's love for us and what Christ accomplished on a cross, there's a balm, there's a cure. If we will allow God to, he will change our hearts so that we're able to see him when we come to church. He'll change our hearts so we're able to see ourselves and my heart's desire is that each time I encounter God and I see myself, I can see myself a little bit differently as a result of God's healing power and His restorative work in my life. Hopefully, I see myself a little bit differently. Do I have setbacks? Do I have moments in which I'm like, well, I feel like I'm right back to square one or beyond? Yes. But I can still come to God knowing there is a cure. There is a balm in Gilead. When we see God... We can't help but see His holiness. We see, if we see His holiness, we can't help but see our unholiness. Granted, we won't like what we see. But thanks be to God, there is balm for my sin-sick soul. The question to consider is this. Are you willing to allow God to help you become more aware of yourself To see yourself as God sees you. 
when we come to church, we're supposed to see God, and in seeing him, Isaiah said, we see ourselves. When we have a true experience with God, it doesn't make us proud, it doesn't make us boastful, it humbles us, it breaks us, and typically we go away different than when we arrived. Why? Because, man, I didn't see that coming. God, thank you for moments that we don't see coming that can help restore, that can help bring us into a relationship with you. Father, that can draw us from the wilderness and into your presence again. Father, thank you for those I didn't see that coming moments. But Father, help us to move beyond that to what you're calling us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've never invited Jesus to be a Lord and Savior, what's keeping you from doing that today? If you're online, I'd love to have a conversation. Maybe if you're here, I'd love to talk to you right now. Just come and see me. Maybe you're sitting here and you've had one of those didn't see that coming moments. You just know you've got some business to take care of today. You can do that at home. You can do that at your pew. You can do that under the altar. I'll be happy to pray with you. But every time I didn't see it coming, I knew there was something I had to do. So if you find yourself in that position today, let me encourage you. Don't leave here. Don't leave here the same as you arrived because the Holy Spirit speaks to you. So take care of that. If you'd like to know more about becoming part of the Bill Creek family, I'd love to have that conversation with you. If there's something else that the Lord's laid on your heart that I'm not even, we've not talked about with the Holy Spirit, you have had this conversation, you just know you have to do something with it. We're going to sing a song. It's an opportunity to worship. It's an opportunity to respond. You can do whatever fits best in your life at this moment. Let's stand and sing it.
10 times on the set pay. Lord, we finally welcome them to the Mill Creek family. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity we had to be in your presence this morning to experience your spirit speaking to us. Lord, as we've seen you, we've seen ourselves. Now, Father, I pray we're leading here changed as a result of seeing ourselves in your holiness. So, God, as we head out into a world that needs Jesus desperately, we have them all to share with them. So help us to do just that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.